Hello everyone, it's Ren here. Welcome to my room. I have decided to um, insist on this investigation into type functionalism as I had introduced it um, in the previous video when I looked and I refer you back to this previous video which I released yesterday on the topic of uh, how NI processes information. So in this particular video today, I think that what I'm going to do is look at the role of the judging functions. So before I go straight into looking at the role of the judging functions, I'll briefly provide you with a recap of what I've been talking about in relation to the perceiving functions yesterday. So what's important to have in mind is that type functionalism considers that there is a relationship of logical continuity between the different functions. So it's not necessarily chronological, but it's logical. And by this, I mean that the first link in the chain in the functional framework is always going to be extroverted perception. You have to think of the reasoning here as the following. You have to think of the fact that any human behavior consists in a particular chain that leads to action, activity, okay? Action oriented to purpose. This cannot happen without being confronted with information. If you're not confronted with any information, uh, well, basically, you're paralyzed into inactivity. In a sense, you're like um, you're like a, a rock or an inanimate being. The very notion of consciousness, which interested interested Jung so much, is this openness to the possibility of manipulating information. So, in the first place, you need to be open to it. That means gathering the information, and that's performed by the extroverted perceiving functions, that's either SE or any. Now, once the information has been gathered, it's in raw form. It's a content that needs to be processed. Only once it has been processed can it be made available to the judging functions, which is why perception, we would say, is logically prior to judgment, always. You cannot move into the domain of judgment, whether it be reasoning, or the action that follows from the reasoning without prior perception, without the presupposition of having accessed information in the first place via extroverted perception, and then having processed it via introverted perception, NI or SI, in order to distill it in a kind of code that the judging functions can navigate that the judging functions can work with. So imagine that um, the judging functions are like, uh, you know, round holes. You get information in a lot of varied shapes via extrovert perception. And the processing of introvert perception takes these different shapes and molds them into round so that they can fit into the round holes of the judging functions. Now the judging functions are of two broad categories and what I would like to call in the first place the deliberative functions. Deliberative functions are introverted thinking and introverted feeling. So the introverted judging functions, the introverted judging functions are deliberative. And I'll sort of clarify a little bit um, what I mean by this. They are logically posterior to the whole phenomenon of perception, but they are still logically prior to extroverted judgments. In other words, extroverted judgments whether it be extroverted feeling, FE, or extroverted thinking, TE, is the last link in the chain. 
first link in the chain, very, very first link in the chain, extroverted perception. Last link, last link in the chain, extroverted judgment. There's a fairly intuitive way of understanding this, is that you can only begin the process of interaction with the world by gathering information, so it has to be extroverted, projected outward toward the world. But here, what you are looking for is gathering information, so it's a matter of perception. And the last link in the chain is acting in the world, making a difference in the world, in the sense changing the overall makeup of the world at your own level by, again, projecting yourself into the world. But whereas in the first place, at the first sort of like level, at the level of the first link in the chain, you were gathering the information, by the time the action is performed, you're making a change, you're delivering a judgment. I think that if you sort of think about these as images, it's fairly reasonable. And the reason then why in the middle you find the introverted functions, introverted perception on the perceiving side, and then introverted judgment on the judgment side, the reason why these are in the middle is because the self, the existence of the self, of the subject, is posited. In other words, Again, you're not just a rock. You know, if you push a rock, the rock moves. With a human being, it's not just a matter of receiving information and then delivering an output, or like a computer, if you like. There is going to be the filter of the ego. And the ego is the one that pr processes the information and then deliberates internally about the information. So there is this internal filtering before a judgment is externalized as an action. This is why any human action is always the result of interpretation of an external content by a particular subjectivity. And this is why like nobody exactly behaves in the same way. If there was no intervening interiority in the chain, it would not be possible to have like lots of different behaviors corresponding to lots of different people, seven billion or more. At the same time, it, you always have to start with extroversion and end with extroversion because you start by reaching out for information and you finish by acting on the basis of that information, but not raw information, information that you have carefully processed and made sense of. Okay. So now that that's, uh, a little bit clearer, I hope. Notice that making sense of information is not a matter for processing. Making sense of information is something that is really a question of reasoning, and reasoning is really the domain of judgment. When you perceive something, you're not really reasoning. Of course, you can perceive in a way that is very refined, insightful. You can see things that other people don't see, but you're not technically reasoning. In fact, this is the reason why thinkers or writers or public figures in history who are incredibly perceptive, incredibly intuitive, or incredibly perceptive in terms of sensation, you'll often find that when these people's lives are really, really dominated by this acuity of perception, they're not, they will never strike you as particularly reasoning, reasoning oriented types. It's because reasoning tends to conflict with intuition. It can work with intuition. It does work with intuition, but in individuals where the perceptive ability is super, extremely super developed, there tends to be a relative repression of reasoning because perception can only get to that level of being highly, highly developed by not being too hampered by reasoning. And reasoning can be associated with the judging functions. Now, that's the case of like, of course, highly intuitive types. The mystic is a really good archetype. The mystic is someone who, for whom Almost everything is intuition and there's very little reasoning going to hamper the intuition, which is why to a very rational, rational or rationalistic type, the mystic in the sense is speaking nonsense. The mystic is very 
much associated with a boundless Ni dominance, because for example, from the point of view of a Ti dominance, they're gonna say, what's the evidence? You're seeing these things, you're intuiting these things, what's the evidence? But for the mystic, not allowing himself to impose too much rigorous reasoning upon the contents of the intuition is what makes the intuition so profound and so important. So that's for the example. Again, that's also the case with sensation. It's not just intuition. You know, intuition is not superior or inferior to sensation. It's just a different mode of gathering information. When you describe, you know, maybe there are people among you who are big into mu music. Music is something that uh, a lot of people like, including myself. But that can also apply to dancing, can also apply to painting, the arts in general. But let's say music. If you consider someone like Prince, for example, there is definitely a sense in which Prince was an unbelievably intuitive musician. But when people say that, they don't mean intuitive in the Jungian sense. They mean that he was incredibly perceptive. He just seemed to know what notes to play. He just seemed to know what mood to go for in his music. That's not intuition, that's sensation. An unbelievably developed sensation. But the reasoning there is somewhat repressed. Again, it's, it seems to be a condition. So that's kind of a way for me to just lay bare how these different tasks associated with the different functions, whether of perception, whether of judgment, whether introverted, whether extroverted, relate to each other. Now, when it comes to the judging functions, I said that I divide them between deliberating and justifying. So what I call justifying is essentially F, E, and T. They're not deliberative functions as such. There are the functions, F, E, and T, that are in charge of carrying the cognitive process to completion, whereby action will follow from them. What I would like to suggest is that once you have those perceptive insight, that perceptive content that is fitted into the round holes of judgments. They're made available for the reasoning of judgments. You have to start with internal deliberation because that is the ego, his way, his, the ego's way of making sense of the information. How does he make sense of the information? I think that's a good way to think about it is to say, once you have a raw content that you perceive, it is quite natural for the ego to seek to make sense of this perception, of this percept, within what he already knows and what he already believes. The totality of your knowledge is really a totality of beliefs. Some are very, very strong beliefs that they are very, very rational and good grounds to believe, but they're nevertheless beliefs. There are a few absolute truths, but the absolute truths are more or less the truths of mathematics. Um, even the belief, for example, that human beings are equal and born equal, it's a belief. It's simply in the sense that you cannot give a rational theorem, a proof, mathematical proof of this. So it's a belief. Now, you could say it's a belief that's strong, and that's very, very grounded, but it's still a belief. And so any individual ego is going to have a vast network of beliefs. Underlying these beliefs are values. For example, technically, equality is a value. Freedom is a value. Justice is a value. Uh, mercy is a value. That's not a belief. A belief the best way to understand the belief is to manage to express it almost as if it were a sentence. For example, I believe that the death penalty should be banned from all countries. Now, that's a belief. It's always underlain by a value or a number of values more specifically. The number of values, you know, will vary, but in this case, probably a value in the sanctity of the human individual uh, that would be, you know, that would be an underlying value for being against capital punishment. And maybe another value is, in this case, uh, the duty of society to take care of its people and to try to help them. 
and there may be other values. So an individual is often more aware of their beliefs than they are of their values because the values are deeper, they're harder to shift around. They are often uh, acquired through a mix of, well, exposure, exposition to a particular culture, the culture you grew up in, particular family tradition, and there might be a genetic side to it as well, but it's still a little bit more difficult to prove. So individuals tend to be more aware of the, of the belief than the values, but if they look deep, they can identify the values. Now, what's really interesting, and that's something that I developed a bit further in my book, is that it seems to me that the essential difference here between the TI approach to deliberating versus the FI approach to deliberating is a, a different focus, a different priority guiding the deliberating. Now, what you're dealing with is perception that's been processed. So the judgment, the introverted judgment is able to make sense, at least in principle, make sense of the information that's been made available by perception. But there must be an, inter an, an internal judgment that's made before it's shifted to the last link in the chain, which is extroverted judgment, where, as I will explain in the, next, in the later video, the key then is to justify the verdict that's been arrived at internally against the reality of the external world. Okay, but we, we will look at that at a later stage. We're still here at the level of introverted judgment. So TI and FI. Now, a verdict must be arrived at before it's tested against the external world. How do they differ? Now, my suggestion is that it's a difference that could be rendered as a, as a difference between authenticity and coherence. Authenticity really defines introverted feeling. And coherence really defines introverted thinking. They are not antinomic, which simply means that an individual who prioritizes authenticity may also value coherence, but they will value, prioritize authenticity more, whereas a TI user will prioritize coherence more. Authenticity to what? Coherence between what? Now, let me make the suggestion that authenticity is really authenticity to the value behind the belief. In other words, when introverted feeling faces a piece of information, the piece of information will have to be made sense of by checking not only that it fits with the belief, but that it respects fundamentally is authentic to the value behind the belief which is why introverted feelers tend to be highly aware of values behind beliefs, whereas in TI users, what you will often find is that the TI user tends to be more focused on the beliefs and the coherence of the different beliefs than they are of the actual values. It's not that they're incapable of getting back all the way back to the values, it's just that they tend to be more aware of the beliefs. And what happens is that from the viewpoint of a TI user, an FI user may have certain incoherences between their beliefs because each of the beliefs, although being authentic to different values, may come in forms that seem to contradict each other. Um, maybe in a later video I'll, I'll try to give more examples. I'm starting to, to run out of time. Whereas in the case of the TI user, there is a great effort, and you see that very obviously in INTPs, you know, TI dominance are always great examples because they showcase highly conscious uh, introverted thinking, so delib internal deliberation. There is a maximal focus on assuring, uh, and ensuring that no belief that they hold has any slightest bit of contradiction to another belief. But this may in fact come at the cost of a, not a neglect of the value behind, but the authenticity to the value behind those beliefs is prioritized less than ensuring that there is a horizontal coherence between the different beliefs. So that's the difference between authenticity to the value behind the belief, and that's for the FI user, and coherence between beliefs, which is for the TI user.
And in this way, you can also perhaps, at least that's what I, I'm thinking, but this will all become more grounded when I move to videos where, you know, all this has been sort of laid down and I can provide examples, concrete examples. Essentially, the stubbornness of the FI user is often because of this steadfast obedience to the, the value, which could cause a certain lack of flexibility when it comes to manip uh, espousing new beliefs or making room for beliefs or maybe even getting rid of certain beliefs. A lot easier for the TI user, but a relative distanciation from the values behind. They are there, they're not prioritized as much. Next video probably will be looking at extroverted judgments and after that we'll start giving more concrete examples. See you soon guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.